known Stephen for a few years, but um, I've got to know him better because of my involvement with the foundation. And I cannot resist the plug. If you want to learn more about the foundation, and you were inspired by what Stephen said, and during that video, he actually uh, it didn't quote the thing that he's certainly become best known for, as far as I'm concerned, and um, picking up on the theme of many of the brilliant speakers that we've already had. You know, don't look down. Don't look down. Where's Mish? Don't look down. Look up at the stars. You know, what better could you have from Stephen? Anyway, my name is Ilyas Khan, and I'm the... Uh, founder and the chief executive of Cambridge Quantum Computing, and I'm the husband of my beautiful wife who's down there, and some of my friends are here, and I have the task of talking about quantum computing. Now, I think that it inspires, the phrase inspires a number of different conflicting emotions. And those emotions, I think, could be curiosity, there might be a little bit of mystery, you know, the idea that quantum mechanics can manifest itself in the context of a computer is a little bit disquieting. The idea that AI, well, of course, it's not AI at the moment, it's just data manipulation. So perhaps we're on the cusp of real artificial intelligence. Now, what the hell is it? And part of my mission, three years ago, I, together with a few friends, started uh, what is now a business called Cambridge Quantum Computing, of course. But our view at the time, in 2014, was that we were looking forward, and we thought that in 10 years' time, so the mid-2020s, there might be the first prototypes of quantum computing. And what we wanted to do was take the tools, the quantum algorithms, and the software that's needed to allow these big lumps of metal to do stuff that's actually useful. We thought that by the middle of the 2020s, the first prototypes would be here. Well, of course, we were wrong by some massive margin. And as of today, I keep an index, there are 17 credible, well-funded projects that are building quantum computers. There are at least three quantum computers in existence today. And I spend an increasing amount of time, especially in this last six months or so, telling people about quantum computers, and I strongly believe that you have to take the mystery out of the quantum machine. And I'll let you into the little secret. Not even Stephen knows how they work. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't. Because nobody does. But just because we don't know how they work doesn't mean that we shouldn't know what we're going to be in for. All of us in this room, even at my young age, Right, you're banished, back, back of the class. <laughs> Even at my young age, I'm going to live through a revolution. You are going to live through a revolution. And that's what we need to talk about. And, oh gosh, right, you don't have to look at that if you feel dizzy. I want to take you back a little bit to the Apollo 11 mission. 1969, for those of you that uh, haven't got quick access to your Wikipedia, Buzz Aldrin, Armstrong, there was a computer that helped the spacecraft get all the way to the moon, land, take off, come back safely. That computer, it doesn't matter how many gigs of memory it had, it doesn't matter what size it was, it doesn't really matter how it was engineered and put together. It was a Turing machine, for those of you that are interested. Alan Turing came up with the idea in the mid-30s that there was a way to compute and allow those computations to help us. And then there became these machines in Princeton, ENIVAC, UNIVAC. Then we had these big things with massive vacuums that were on and off. And the on represented a one, and the off represented a zero. And if you amalgamated these ones and zeros, hey presto, you get a man on the moon. And 10 years later, IBM came up with the personal computer. And that personal computer had hundreds of times more processing power than the machine that sent the 
Apollo 11 mission up, and then another 10 years later, we saw a picture earlier of this big brick of a phone. I was too young to know that. I have no, no knowledge about the 1980s. But suddenly, this processing power went on and on and on. But the fact is that all of that is a mere blip. In a 1,000 years' time, nobody's going to remember that. What will they remember? They will remember the Industrial Revolution, right? Who's going to tell me? Spinning Jenny, what year? I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. I definitely wasn't around then. 1764. And what was the impact of the Spinning Jenny? Right? Northwest of England, Lancashire. It was iconic when human beings stopped having to lift things. We suddenly could rely not on other animals like mules or slaves, but on machines. And we started parallel processing. And a little bit down the road, then what happened? Steam engines came. Before you knew it, there was automobiles. And then we were pilfering the earth for hydrocarbons. We had aeroplanes. And then Turing came along. The next revolution is the one that matters. Because we are on the brink. In fact, we're into it right now. Quantum computers and quantum computing is the way that nature computes. Now, we're going to do a quantum mechanical exercise right here within the allotted TEDx 18 minutes. So those of you that are already thinking about leaving, leave now. And the rest are going to be part of the competition. Now, give you a little bit of context. The term quantum computing came about in the late 70s and early 1980s, was a fantastic scientist, one of the greats, not as great as Stephen, but nevertheless, right up there, Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate. And coincidentally, at about the same time, David Deutsch, who's in Oxford, thought of this idea as well. But he was talking about parallel universes and multiverses, and we're definitely not going there today. So we're going to stick to Richard Feynman. And Richard Feynman was looking at how free energy dissipation affects computation. Now, this was a topic that is still of great importance. All of you will have a hot iPhone after a little while. Free energy, now it, could, it doesn't matter what it is, comes in, electricity, and it turns it around, and you have a computation of what comes out the other way is an output. And in the middle, you lose a lot of energy. Now, it doesn't matter what you do, whether you're driving a car or having a, a computer to do work for you, free energy dissipation is an interesting topic. And Feynman had a thought experiment. He said, what if we computed the way that nature computes? Now, we've got at the back of our cortex a few billion neurons, which in turn have trillions and trillions of synaptic charges. I'm not going in your area, doctor, sorry. I will not tread in your turf. But the energy that goes into that is infinitesimal. You can't even light a light bulb with it, or a very, very, very light and low energy light bulb. If you try to replicate that, you'd need enough energy to power 10,000 homes. So why can nature do that? In the back of your brain, in a leaf, a leaf takes light. And what does it convert it to? Amongst other things, oxygen. And it does it with such efficiency. So Feynman said, if we could compute using atoms, we would compute as nature computes. And for 30 years, more than 30 years, we've been wondering and dreaming of whether we can actually do what nature does. Will nature allow us to do it? And I'm going to just read, I've just broken another rule. At any, so the end, this is 1985. In fact, I've got a little thing there of the article, easily um, Googleable. And if you haven't yet read it, you should. Richard Feynman, 1985. And at the end of this article, which was actually in turn um, the speech that he'd made a few months earlier, he says, at any rate, it seems to me that the laws of physics present no barrier to reducing the size of computers until bits are the size of atoms, and quantum behavior holds dominant sway. Now, it's that last bit, 
quantum behavior holds dominant sway. It's not written up there. Don't try and read it there. What does that mean? What it means, see, the universe in its indivisible elements at the infinitesimal level works on rules that are different that you and I and everybody else that's macroscopic operates on. Now, just to go back to a computer for a second, for those of you that don't recognize this, anybody over the age of 35, this is an abacus. This is no different from, well, I won't take it out because I can't find it. You've all got smartphones. Your smartphone is that. I kid you not. Inside your smartphone, there are billions and billions of transistors. And the transistor is either on or off. We've just been using abacuses, but a quantum computer will actually, for the first time, allow us to compute in a parallel manner. And the reason it will allow us to do that is a premise that I'd like just to ask you to put into your mind right now. Imagine, for a second, the most powerful computer that you can think of. It doesn't matter. You might, you know, some of you might get turned on by thinking of this big, huge machines, the men amongst you. The rest of you might think of what the computer could do. It doesn't matter. Just think of a big, big, big computer, the most powerful. Now, multiply that a billion times. You might get close to thinking, then, of what ultimately a quantum computer will do. And it doesn't matter whether we're four years away, or eight years away, or ten years away. We're very, very close. And the original prototypes are here already. And the reason is that they're different. They're not just faster. The laws, as I said earlier, of quantum mechanics allow us to do something that we've never been able to do up until now. Now, there are two tags, superposition, entanglement. It doesn't matter. It's another language. Every discipline has its own language. My job is to lift us up away from the language. And I want to show you, tell you and show you and hopefully share with you what that means. So we're going to do the quantum mechanical experiment before I get kicked off the stage. Right. So I don't believe in volunteers. So I'm going to pick people. Right. Um, I'd like 10 people to stand up as I point to you and say, stood up. That gentleman there, because you gave me a nice smile. Yeah, you. Yeah. One, two, that boy there and the girl next to you. You, look at me. That's you. Yeah, up. And you. Three, thank you. Thank you. Mara, the wife, of course. Miss Mother. Up. One, two, three, four, five. Thane, six. Come on, stand up. Somebody from this. Anybody up here? That lady there with the chin in her hand. Set. Yes, you. Yes, yes, stand up, please. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we need three more. Eight. We need two more. That lady there, Josephine, the hockey player. Thank you. And one of the speakers, please. Right. Ten. That was a classical experiment. I did ten bits of computation. I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can't count. There's actually eleven. <laughs> a quantum computer in the same number of steps will do how many? How many of you would have been standing up in the same number of steps? Two to the power 10. 1,024. Sit down, please. Thank you. That is one manifestation of what a quantum computer will do. And I'm going to close. Everybody asks me, those that ask me what does it do, want to know whether it's going to break Bitcoin. Of course it's going to break Bitcoin. What kind of question is that? Bitcoin's not special. Um, distributed ledgers. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, now I'm going to have a horde of Bitcoin people descending on me. So anything that involves a public key, anything that involves a public key is open to encryption. RSA 2048, go on the Microsoft website, it tells you that a classical computer will take about a billion years. So by the time they've solved the key, the problem's gone. A quantum computer will solve that problem in less than a minute. So that's one manifestation of what it does. I'm not interested in encryption. I'll tell you what I'm interested in. Drug delivery. We actually are more similar than we are different at the fundamental level. Of course, things turn out different. Drug 
delivery and the new materials that enable us to do that. For the first time in human history, we can go to the profoundest mystery of what this universe is all about. We will be able to encode the genome in its entirety for all 8 billion people. Energy surplus, the way in which we store electricity, photovoltaic converters, fertilizers. This is why this is important. Our lifestyles will change. Our children, and I'm going to finish with this, because actually I was meant to do this on slide two and I forgot. But I'm going to do it anyway, because I like this. You know, if you had our, well, my dad, and my granddad who fought in Gallipoli, and his dad, and three or four before us, you only need six or seven of them to get back to the spinning jenny, right? Well, I've got a son. We've got two sons, actually. My oldest is 12. And by the time he's my age at 25, there is... <laughs> <laughs> you, she forgot. Anyway, it doesn't matter. By the time he's at my age, all of this will have happened. We'll all probably still be alive. That's why it's important. And it is happening. This is not science fiction. And this disruption... Well, this is the disruptor of all disruptions. If you're planning something today, you need to know. Governments know. Large organizations know. Those of you that... who uh, well, I won't ask you. If you own stock in Google or in Microsoft or in IBM, these organizations are investing more in quantum computing than anything else. This is happening. Now, this is the end of my little 18 minutes. I'm going to leave you with a thought. As people say to me, so what can we do? What will these things do to us? And no matter what I say, I never, I never hit the essence. And I'll tell you why I don't, because actually I don't know what we're going to do. Nobody knows. So a gentleman by the name of Newton, another Cambridge man, said, I seem to, any Oxford people in here, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on a seashore and diverting myself in now and again finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered before me, we don't know what quantum computers will do because up until now we've never had them. And you, especially the younger ones, will be the ones that will tell me what we can do with quantum computers. There are three quantum computers in existence today. Before 2024, all of our lives will be impacted by quantum computing. If you have not spent time learning about this, learn about it now. Thank you very much indeed.